Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about reductions using lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems I signed last lecture. So in the first set of problems, I ask you to show what conditions would afford the corresponding boron enolates. And so in the top case, we would have to use dicyclohexyl boron triflate and diisopropyl ethylamine to afford this product. However, you could have also used the 9-BBN derived boron chloride, and that would also give you a Z-enolate product. Now, in the next case, we want the E-enolate product, and so we would have to use dicyclohexyl boron chloride with triethylamine. Now that we've done that one, let's look at the next problem. So if we were to take these compounds and treat them with an aldehyde, such as benzaldehyde, what type of product would we get? And in the first case, we would get a 1,2-syn product, and in the other case, we would get a 1,2-anti product. And so it's important to remember that even though I've drawn these as single enantiomers, these would actually be a racemic mixture of this enantiomer and its corresponding mirror image. Same in the second case. Now with that, let's get to today's material, sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride reductions. Predominantly, we're going to be talking about carbonyl reduction reactions, but we're also going to talk about the reduction of alkyl halides in the case of lithium aluminum hydride. So for most cases, those are the only two reducing agents that you see used. Sodium borohydride, which is typically only used for reducing aldehydes and ketones, and lithium aluminum hydride, which can reduce all carbonyls as well as several other functional groups. However, there are many variations of these reagents that you'd use for specific purposes, such as calcium borohydride, sodium cyanoborohydride, sodium triacetoxyborohydride, and diisobutyl aluminum hydride. And if there's an interest, we can discuss this in a later episode. But as this is mainly an introductory course, we're not going to focus on them too much. So let's start with sodium borohydride. Here we can take an aldehyde or a ketone and convert it to the corresponding primary or secondary alcohol using sodium borohydride. So some of the advantages are you can do these reductions in a protic solvent. So quite often you'll see methanol used or water used as your solvent for the reaction, which is pretty useful because even though this is somewhat basic and it can form hydrogen gas, or borane derivatives, it's still possible to do these reductions in protic solvents. And in fact, they work best in protic solvents most of the time. Esters and amides are typically tolerated by sodium borohydride. Occasionally here and there you will see reductions of esters to alcohols, but it's not that common. And it's because esters are relatively less electrophilic as they are not as electrophilic as aldehydes or ketones. So relative to them, they're not as reactive. There are other reducible functional groups that you could have in a molecule, but these tend to be really well tolerated with sodium borohydride, such as a nitro group, an epoxide, a nitrile, or a carboxylic acid. Now there's some things to consider when you're working with sodium borohydride, such as ameniums and imines will also be reduced. So if you were to take an aldehyde and treat it with an amine and then treat it with sodium borohydride, you would be forming a reduced product to an amine, which might be desirable, but it's also something you might want to avoid potentially. It's also possible to add in 1,4 addition of borohydride, so you could partially reduce an enone. And the reason for that is you can do hydroboration reactions. And if you recall from last lecture, where we were talking about using um, boranes to produce uh, thermodynamic enolates of like boron enolates, it's possible to do that type of addition. And because borohydride can form boron 3 hydride species, it's possible to do that type of reduction even when you're just using sodium borohydride. Uh, additionally, while there's four hydrides per one sodium uh, and per one boron in each sodium borohydride, some of these protons will slowly react with solvent, depending on pKa of the solvent and pH of the mixture, um, but some of it will be consumed. So you usually use a super stoichiometric amount of sodium borohydride, usually one full molar equivalent, even though there's four active equivalents. Sometimes people even use more. Now the mechanism of this reaction is twofold. So first, the borohydride acts as a hydride donor to the carbonyl, but it also acts as a Lewis acid. And so the carbonyl can coordinate the boron, which then liberates a hydride, forming this boronate complex, which can then, upon workup, afford the primary or secondary alcohol. This, in this case, we've just shown the reduction of a ketone, but the same mechanism would hold true with an aldehyde. You just have an H instead of R prime. Now, some examples of this include the reduction of this aldehyde containing pyridine, where you can see a primary alcohol is afforded in methanol in 30 minutes at zero degrees. Another example is this chiral trifluoromethyl derivative uh, of an aldehyde, where you see this reduction at the primary alcohol position. And one final example, there's an, an acetal protected aldehyde here, and this ketone undergoes reduction by sodium borohydride. So this is a good example that I wanted to highlight 
because this is exactly why you might want to use an acetal because you can protect an aldehyde and prevent it from being reduced when you want to reduce another functional group. And so here that was the purpose of installing this functional group, just to mask the aldehyde. Okay, so now let's talk about lithium aluminum hydride. Sometimes you'll see lithium aluminum hydride written as LAH rather than LIALH4, just because it's a shorter abbreviation. But when we look at uh, lithium aluminum hydride, it's quite a powerful reductant. Um, it's because the aluminum is also a very good Lewis acid. So even the boranes can be weak Lewis acids, aluminum is like a very strong Lewis acid. And so most of the time, if you have a functional group that can be reduced, it likely will. Um, you can always mitigate this by doing shorter reaction times, milder conditions, um, but this is typically a substrate specific idea. So there's no like general rule of thumb other than milder conditions, more dilute, fewer equivalents, etc. However, if you have alkenes, those typically won't be reduced by lithium aluminum hydride. So in this first example, we can see an aldehyde or a ketone. This gets reduced the same way that uh, sodium borohydride would reduce. And so you just get a reduction. Now in this next example, you can see that there's an ester, a carboxylic acid, or an acyl halide. This gets converted all the way to the primary alcohol. So two equivalents of hydride are delivered. However, if you were to treat an amide with lithium aluminum hydride, this just reduces it to the amine. And so while the alkoxy group is extruded from an ester, the amino group is retained in an amide. And that's because it can go through an imenium intermediate before the final delivery of a hydride. But let's talk through the mechanism of the lithium aluminum hydride mediated reduction of esters. So similar to the borohydride case, the ester carbonyl is able to coordinate to the aluminum and liberate a hydride. The hydride then reduces this to a CH. It's then possible for the the alkoxide to collapse down and eliminate off the an alkoxide as well. This alkoxide can then attack the aluminum species, which helps deliver a hydride. This uh, alkoxide, aluminum alkoxide, can then be converted to the alcohol upon subsequent workup. And so when you're doing a workup for these reactions, it's important to consider the conditions that you do this, because lithium aluminum hydride is a very reactive reductant. And so you have to reduce it under very careful controlled conditions. And a really good resource to use uh, is Not Voodoo X, which is uh, made available from the University of Rochester. And they have a really good uh, list it, listing of the procedure for a Pfizer workup, which is a, quite a common workup that's used in industry for working up uh, LAH reductions as well as dieball reductions. So some examples of LAH reductions in the literature include this one shown here, where this diene remains totally untouched while the ester gets reduced to an alcohol. In this next case, we have this uh, keto ester, and both the ketone and the ester are reduced to a diol. In this last case, we have this diamide, which is reduced to a diamine. And so as I was trying to state earlier, LAH is quite a powerful reductant. So there's other reductions that can occur with LAH. One example is you can convert a nitrile to a primary amine, and so this is shown here, the reduction of a nitrile. Another possible reaction is the reduction of a nitroarene. However, nitroarenes, when treated with lithium aluminum hydride, tend to form mixtures of several different products. So if you wanted to make an aniline, most of the time this wouldn't be your best bet. There's several different ways to reduce nitroarenes, and they tend to be very much substrate specific, even though there's more common ones, uh, conditions such as like iron and HCl. There's still very much our case by case. Another functional group that you can reduce is an epoxide. And so where a ketone does a one, two reduction here, we can reduce the alpha position and we uh, get a hydride delivered here. If you had a more substituted epoxide, you'd get a tertiary alcohol. Finally, you can reduce an azide to an amine. And so here an azide just gets converted to nitrogen gas. And then in workup, the protons are given to the alkane. And so one other reaction that can happen with lithium aluminum hydride is the reduction of alkyl halides. And this is a really important one to highlight, and most textbooks don't cover this in great detail. But if you're doing an LAH reduction and you have halides almost anywhere, with the exception of fluorides in most cases, you're going to see some consumption of those uh, halides, especially in the case of alkyl halides. So in general, iodides are more reactive than bromides, which are much more reactive than chloride. Additionally, if you have an allylic or a benzylic halide, that's more reactive than a primary halide, which is more reactive than a secondary halide, and that's much more reactive than an aryl or a tertiary halide. And neopental halides tend to be very, very poorly reactive towards LAH. 
So in this first example, because we have benzyl bromide, it's benzylic and it's a bromide. So this reaction takes one minute and it goes to full conversion. A similar reaction uses uh, allyl bromide, which only takes 15 minutes at room temperature and goes to full conversion. If we have a primary alkyl bromide, it takes slightly longer, 30 minutes at room temperature, but essentially goes to full conversion. However, if we have an alkyl chloride, it takes much, much longer to get a high conversion to the corresponding alkane. So 24 hours as opposed to 30 minutes. Now, once we move to secondary positions, uh, you can see this is kind of similar to the chloride where 24 hours affords full conversion, which is not, not too bad. However, if we have a tertiary bromide, it still does not convert very well under ambient conditions with lithium aluminum hydride. Uh, additionally, if we have benzyl, uh, bromobenzene, it takes 24 hours and we still only get 28% conversion. Additional case would be this neopental bromide, which shows very low conversion even after 24 hours. And that's just because of all the steric bulk that this big terp-butyl group uh, has. So it just blocks aluminum from getting in there very well at all. So one thing you can do if you're trying to do a lithium aluminum hydride reduction and it's not going super quickly or it's not going at all, you can try heating things up. And this can also make chlorides more reactive, even though I haven't illustrated this here. If you want to see examples of chlorides becoming more reactive, you can read this reference here. In this case, we take cyclohexyl bromide, which is a weird case where after 24 hours, we still get low conversion. Cycloheptyl bromide converts okay, cyclopentyl bromide converts okay, but for some reason, cyclohexyl bromide doesn't convert very well. However, if we just instead do this at 65 degrees for 12 hours, we can get almost full conversion. So these reactions will happen better at higher temperatures. So if it's not working too well, just try heating it up. So for this assign for this lecture, I'd like to assign two, three practice problems. First, uh, propose a reductant for the following transformation. So which reducing agent would give you this alcohol? Additionally, if you were to take this substrate here and treat it with lithium aluminum hydride, what would the product of the following reaction be? One final problem is taking this substrate shown here, what reducing agent should you use to get this alcohol? And what are some possible concerns that this molecule could have that would uh, inspire you to choose the reducing agent that, you, that you're that you choosing or proposing? And so with that, I hope this has been a really useful lecture on reducing agents, specifically lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride. If you have any comments or questions, I'd appreciate them below. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you.